this lecture, we are going to discuss the topic of generating data. In all our previous examples, we looked at some very small arrays. This was useful for us since we could do things like just look at an equation and immediately know whether or not the answer we got made sense. But what if we wanted to generate data with hundreds or thousands of dimensions? In that case, typing things by hand is clearly not a feasible solution. Now, you might think, doesn't data just come from Excel files or CSVs? And indeed, we will cover that scenario. But obviously, there will be times when you need to generate large matrices whose values have nothing to do with the data. One example of that is with neural networks. A neural network is made up of many large matrices, which you will randomly initialize and then train using an algorithm called backpropagation. Another common reason to create your own arrays is to generate synthetic data to test your algorithm on. Often, using synthetic data is extremely useful because it allows us to test the efficacy of our models. Since you generated the data yourself, you know the true answer, and you can see how close your model gets to that true answer. One picture I really like, which you can find on the scikit-learn documentation, is this comparison between clustering algorithms. In this picture, we test a set of clustering algorithms on different kinds of data sets, all synthetically generated, to see how they perform. And it's clear that in some situations, some algorithms perform better than others. So things that you can see are very useful. Things where you can make comparisons are very useful. In any case, now that you're convinced that generating arrays is necessary, let's look at some ways we can do that. So let's start with something simple, an array of all zeros. In order to create an array of all zeros, we call the function np.zeros and we pass in a tuple specifying the desired size of our array. So that would be np.zeros23. All right, so this is an array of zeros of size two by three. We can do the same thing if we want an array of all ones, we just call the ones function instead. So that would be np.1s23. All right, so that's an array of all ones. Now, what if we want an array of a different number, like 10? Well, there isn't a function called tens, but remember that anything multiplied by one is just that thing. So we could do 10 times np.1s23. So that's an array of tens. One important matrix in linear algebra is the identity matrix. The identity matrix is the matrix analog of the number one. That's why when you take a matrix and multiply it by its inverse, you get identity. In NumPy, the function to create an identity matrix is called I, as in E-Y-E. -E. So let's try this out. NP.EYE3. And this creates a three by three identity matrix. Now that spelling might seem strange to you, but in fact, it's quite common, for example, in other languages like MATLAB. The reason for this is you don't want to have a special variable or function with just a single letter, which you might use somewhere else in your program. So using a homonym or more specifically a homophone is one solution. The word spelled I is pronounced the same way as the word spelled E-Y-E. Next, and this stuff is very important. We're going to talk about how to generate arrays with random numbers. This is used pretty much everywhere from deep learning to Markov chain Monte Carlo. And obviously this is necessary to create your own synthetic data, such as something that looks like this. So how do we generate random numbers or more specifically arrays with random numbers in them? Luckily, NumPy has a module called random that contains such functionality. So the simplest way to do this is perhaps with a function, which is itself called random. So we do np.random.random and we get back a random number. If we pass in a tuple for the shape, we get back a random array of that shape. So we can do np.random.random23 And this gives us a random matrix of size two by three. 
Now, whenever you create random numbers, it's always important to ask, what distribution do those random numbers come from? For example, the numbers you get from a uniform distribution will be different from the numbers you get from a normal distribution. And typically, when you're generating random data, you want to generate that data from a specific distribution. For example, if you want to have a mix of both positive and negative numbers, you wouldn't want to use the random function, since that draws from the uniform 0, 1 distribution. And as you can see, the numbers we got are all between a 0 and 1. Now, of course, there are better ways of determining what distribution your random numbers came from, some of which we'll look at later in this course. One common technique is to visualize the numbers in a histogram. If your random numbers came from the distribution you think they did, then their histogram should look like the distribution. So another pretty common scenario is that we want to draw numbers from the normal distribution, also known as the Gaussian. In order to do that, we use a function called randn. So let's try that. So let's say np.random.randn23. All right, so you see that we get some positive and some negative numbers. In fact, this function draws random numbers from the standard normal distribution, meaning that this data has mean zero and variance one. Now, what's very odd about the randn function is that, unlike zeros and ones and random, this function does not accept a tuple as input for the shape. Instead, each dimension is passed in as a separate argument. So you just have to remember this little detail about the NumPy library. Well, now that we know how to generate random numbers, we can also calculate some statistics. So let's generate a big long array of 10,000 numbers drawn from the standard normal. So that's r equals np.random.randin 10,000. We can calculate the mean of this array by calling r.mean. So r.mean. All right, so it's pretty close to zero as expected. And as with a few other functions, this is also a top level function as well as an instance method. So we can do np.mean r. All right, we get the same answer. We can also calculate the variance using r.var. So r.var. And we get an answer very close to 1, as expected. Now, sometimes we want the standard deviation instead of the variance, which there is a special function for called std. So if we call r.std, we get the square root of a variance. And as an exercise, you might want to double check that this is, in fact, the square root of the variance. Now, another common scenario is if I have a matrix of random data. So let's say I have a matrix of size 10,000 by 3, where each element is drawn from the standard normal. So that's r equals np.random.randn 10,000 by 3. Now, although we could calculate the mean of this entire array, what we usually want to do is calculate the mean of each row or the mean of each column. So if we do r dot mean axis equals zero, this calculates the mean of each column. So the output is a length three array. If we do r dot mean axis equals one, we get a big long array. So in order to check its shape, we can call dot shape and we see that it's 10,000 as expected. Now, typically when you're working with data in machine learning, it's usually organized so that each row is a sample or an observation and each column is a specific measurement. So in our case, we would have 10,000 observations and three measurements per observation. And as an example of that, let's say I want to compare some attributes of people in some kind of psychology experiment where each row would represent a person. So each row has a different name, like Alice, Bob, Carol, and so forth. 
Each column would represent a measurement, like say ratings out of 10 for specific traits, like openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. That is to say, each row of the matrix is a vector observation. And so, when you have vectors, the analog of the variance is the covariance. Now, there is a function called cove in NumPy, so let's try that. So we get np.cove r. But we see that this gives us a very large array. So let's check its shape by doing dot shape. And it's actually 10,000 by 10,000. So what we've learned is that the cove function by default treats each column as a vector observation. And by the way, this is not the convention in the rest of the NumPy stack. So for example, if you're using scikit-learn or TensorFlow or PyTorch, we do expect that each row is a sample observation. In any case, we can easily fix this by transposing R first. So we can do np.cove r.t. All right, and this is a three by three matrix as expected. And also as expected, it's close to identity. Another option is to use the argument rovar. So that's np.cove r rovar equals false. So the default is true. And we get our same three by three matrix. One final topic I want to consider in this lecture is how to randomly generate integers. So far, we've discussed real numbers only. And luckily, NumPy has a function for that called randint. If we look at the documentation, we see that this function takes in a few arguments. The first argument is low, which is the minimum integer you want to randomly sample. The second argument is high, which is the maximum integer you want to randomly sample. Notice that low is inclusive, while high is exclusive. That follows the same convention as everything else in Python, so I assume that makes sense. The next argument specifies the size. So like the other functions, you can generate a single number, or you can generate an array of any size that you pass in. So we can do np.random.randint 0, 10, size 3, 3. And this gives us a 3x3 three three array with random integers between 0 and 10 exclusive. Another useful function is the choice function, which randomly selects items from a one-dimensional input array. If we look at the arguments, we see that there are a few. The first argument is the input array A, which is the thing you want to randomly select from. Optionally, you can also just pass in an integer and if you pass in an integer n, you'll get random numbers from 0 up to n exclusive. So it works basically the same way as randint. The second argument is the size. For most cases, I'd want an integer here. For example, given a set of 10,000 observations, give me 10 of them. The next argument is replace, which takes in a Boolean. This is useful for situations like bootstrapping, where you actually want to be able to randomly select the same item more than once. Finally, we have the argument p, which allows you to specify at what probabilities each item should be selected. This is optional, so if you don't specify anything, then it assumes a uniform distribution. So let's try this out. So if I do np.random.choice 10 and size 3, 3, You see that again, I get a random matrix of size 3 by 3 with integers from 0 up to 10 exclusive. 